Well, good morning. <clears throat> it is a blessing for us to be here this morning, um, as always. <clears throat> I have to excuse my voice. It's, well, it's like it is almost every Sunday morning anyway. We will be starting in John chapter 10 today. Things are going fairly well up in West Leiden. We do have some important decisions to make over the next six months, two to three years. I don't know how long we personally will be there, but uh, that the Lord would continue his blessing uh, as I try every Sunday to preach the gospel to those dear folks. John chapter 10, <clears throat> beginning in verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hireling or a hired hand and not a shepherd who is not the owner of the sheep beholds the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hireling and is not concerned about the sheep. I am the good shepherd and I know my own and my own know me, even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they shall hear my voice, and they shall become one flock with one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one has taken my life from me but I lay it down of my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down and have authority to take it up again. This commandment I receive from my Father. And our Lord and our God, ever-living God, life-giving God, we come before your throne this morning in the name of Jesus Christ in his standing in his righteousness, in his faith, in his holiness. We claim none of these things as our own. But Lord, we rest in him this morning. And lest, Lord God, we are fools. And knowing, Lord God, your great desire for your people, even the sheep of your pasture. For you are our God. And we are the people of your pasture and the sheep of your hand. I pray this morning, Lord God, that you would use these stumbling words from these sinful lips. And by your grace, make it bread to nourish your people for your glory. May the spirit of truth glorify your son. And may the Lord Jesus Christ, who has promised to be with us this morning, as we've gathered together in his name, be more than a spectator to us, but by his spirit an active participant, even to the piercing of our hearts with his own word. So be glorified, O living God, in Jesus' name. <clears throat> Amen. Being a shepherd in biblical times was not an easy job. It was very arduous and dangerous. There's danger from thieves, danger from wild beasts. You had the foolishness of sheep. They wander. If they fall, they have a hard time getting back up. They're, they're helpless in essence. Jesus pays us no compliment in calling us his sheep. In Isaiah 53, it says, We all like sheep have gone astray. Everyone has turned 
to our own way and thank God the Lord has laid upon Christ the iniquity of us all. In Psalm 58 verse 3, <clears throat> men go astray from the womb as soon as they are born. Prone to wander. <clears throat> My daughter and her husband have two little corgis. Well, they're not little for corgis. They're big for corgis. Corgis are bred to be herders, like sheep herders. And when the older one, Max, was younger, I don't know if he still does it, they'd show us videos on Instagram of him at the doggy daycare and this little guy trying to herd all the other dogs into the corner. They're trained to do that because sheep wander. Sheep can be foolish. Sheep can be helpless. And the shepherd's job, even as we read here in John chapter 10, of necessity must be a job of full commitment. As Jesus says here, the shepherd lays down his life for the sheep because they are his sheep. They're his livelihood. There is, in essence, everything he owns. Whereas the hireling, the hired hand, whenever danger lurks, he flees when the wolves come. Because he is a hireling. David knows by experience this situation as being a fully committed shepherd. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, the giant Goliath is insulting the armies of the living God and therefore insulting the living God himself. Fear has struck the great armies of Israel. They're shaking in their boots. And as Goliath challenges them to individual combat, none of them moves, not even Saul, who's somewhat of a physical giant and great warrior in himself. David comes from the sheep to bring lunch for his brothers. He sees what's going on, and he asks what the reward will be, and his brothers say, you're just here for your own glory. You're just here to cause trouble. Saul finally learns about David's willingness to go into the valley to fight this giant. And he says in verse 33, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth, while he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant was tending his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I went out after him and attacked him, rescued it from his mouth, and when he rose up against me, I seized him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them since he has taunted the armies of the living God. David knows by experience what it is for the shepherd to put his life on the line to rescue the sheep and to care for the sheep. So he would know the truth of Jesus' words in John chapter 10 that we read a minute ago because he lived them. Probably a number of times throughout the years. And in that knowledge of the full commitment of the shepherd, he writes Psalm 23, not as a shepherd, but as one of the sheep. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff. They comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the midst of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over, and surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The hope and the trust of the sheep under the care of the heavenly shepherd. And in the midst of that testimony of God's provision for him, of the peace of God 
that can be his, of the guidance of the rod and staff of God, of the restoration of the soul under the hand of God, of God's goodness and God's everlasting mercy, comes verse 4. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. The valley of the shadow of death is not a peaceful valley. The valley of the shadow of death is not where we lie down in the green grass. It's not where the peaceful waters flow. It is a deep, dark valley, a steep valley, possibly a chasm or a gorge, not a place where you would go for a peaceful vacation. I remember once after we, soon after we, I don't know, before we moved here, when I first started to go to Barneville, a friend of mine and I decided to climb out of Trenton Gorge. He was a former Green Beret, and he had no problem. I almost died all the way up. And where there was a problem, it was trespassing. And we were met up to the top by someone from the electric company. What are you boys doing here? Where'd you come from? We climbed up the gorge. You're kidding me. It's not the place you wanted to, to climb up out of or go down into. It was very steep, and these two young men were very stupid. But it's not how green is my valley. But he says, even though I have to go through that dark shadow of death, that dark valley, I shall not fear. Now, we know throughout the Psalms there are quite a few times when David is afraid. So if David was being completely honest and the Holy Spirit allowed him to be completely honest with us, he would say, even though I go through the valley of the shadow of death, there's no real reason for me to fear because thou art with me. Your rod and your staff, they will guide and correct me. I see this kind of a parallel to what Jesus teaches us to pray. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. I am confident of your deliverance. But down in that valley, I guess to use the words of Maurice Sendek, is where the wild things are. Those things that go bump in the night. Those things whose purpose is to steal and to kill and to destroy, as Jesus says in John 10.10. That valley is where Goliath is. That valley is where the ones that would seek to destroy us and swallow us up in death would long to have their way with us. But nonetheless, even though we do have the protection of the Lord, we will all eventually go through that valley. Unless, by God's grace, we are still alive when he returns. How do I go into that valley and come out of that valley? How do I go into that valley and not be consumed? How do I go into that valley and not be swallowed up by death? The way is this. As we read in John 10, the good shepherd goes before us into the darkness. In Luke chapter 22, verse 53, at Jesus' arrest, after Peter has cut off Malchus's ear and all the rest of that which is going on, he says to the, those that come to arrest him, and this is from the NIV, this is your hour when darkness reigns. 
This is your hour when the power of darkness has come to consume. This is your hour when the power of darkness and death has come to do its best. This is your hour. Let's get it over with. In John chapter 12, Jesus says that if a corn of wheat doesn't fall into a if it doesn't fall into a ground and die, it divides alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. Talking about his own death. And he says later on, What shall I say then to my father? Father, deliver me from this hour. It was for this hour that I came. It is for the hour of darkness that I came. It is for the battle over death that I came. Father, glorify thy name. I must drink the cup of darkness and death for my sheep. And I will go alone. What is it in Isaiah 59, is it? That the Lord saw that there was no man, no one to intercede. So he brought salvation with his own arm. As they come to arrest Jesus in John 18, verse 8. He says, I am the one you seek. Let these others go their way. I must tread the valley of death alone. I must tread this dark chasm alone. His trial illegally is at night. He is crucified during the day. But as it says in Matthew 27, 45, from the sixth hour, there was darkness over the land until the ninth hour. Such darkness, not only darkness physically, but even in a sense, darkness and the awareness of the Lord Jesus Christ as he cries out in verse 46, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you left me to endure this all alone? And we know that cry comes from Psalm 22, the great messianic psalm that does talk about his crucifixion. <clears throat> Excuse me. As it says in verse 1, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Far from my deliverance are the words of my groaning. And he goes on like that throughout the psalm. But notice the language in a couple verses. Verses 7 and 8. Or verses 6 through 8. I am a worm and not a man. A reproach of men and despised by the people. And all who see me sneer at me. They separate their lips. They wag their heads saying, commit yourself to the Lord. Let him delight, let him deliver him. Let him rescue him because he delights in him. And we hear in that the, the, the mocking of those at the feet of the cross. He saved others, let him save himself. If you're the son of God, come down off that cross. Save yourself. The problem is if Jesus saves himself, he cannot save them. He cannot save us. <clears throat> in verse 11, be not far from me, for trouble is near. There is none to help all alone. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They open wide their mouth at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue cleaves to my jaws. And thou dost lay me in the dust of death, for dogs have surrounded me. A band of evildoers has encompassed me. They pierce my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They, they look, they stare at me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. Notice some of the language we've had here. And I know that I could do a lot more with this passage. We've got the mockers. We've got Christ going in to the darkness alone. 
We have the bulls, we have the lions, we have the dogs, we have the wild things that have come to have their way with him. We have according to Genesis chapter 3, the serpent biting his heel. They come to kill, they come to destroy, and he dies. And in doing so, he destroys all the wild things. Or at least pulls out their teeth and pulls out their claws. And he destroys by his death the power of death itself. In Hebrews 2 verse 14, Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he also likewise partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who has the power of death, even the devil, came to destroy the works of the devil. And to, li- to deliver those who for all their lives had fear of death. Again, 1 John 3, 8, the Son of Man appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. In Colossians 2, verses 12 and 13, I want to start earlier than that. I've got some time. Um, I'll start back in verse 9. For in him, in Christ, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, and in him you have been made complete. He is head over all rule and authority, and in him you were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which were hostile to us. He has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross." Every accusation that the accuser of the brethren could bring before us has been left at the cross. And when he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, the principalities and powers, he made a public display of them having triumphed over them through him or through the cross. Defeated the power of the devil. Defeated the power of death. The demonic powers and their authority broken. As Peter says in Acts chapter 2 verse 24. That Jesus rose from the dead for it was impossible that death could hold him. And in Christ it is impossible for death to hold you. In Christ, yes, you shall go into the valley of the shadow of death. But in Christ, you shall go through the valley of the shadow of death and be raised again. I often think of those, that passage in uh, um, Psalm 24. Lift up your head, O ye gates, be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors. The king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, mighty in battle. He is the king of glory. So lift up your heads, O ye gates, be ye lift up ye everlasting doors. The king of glory shall come in. 
who is the king of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the king of glory. And, and I have this picture of my mind that as the triumphant Christ comes through those gates and they begin to close, he commands, keep those gates open, there'll be a multitude following me. who will come through death, through resurrection, and enter these gates of glory with me. And at that resurrection, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 57, when that time comes, when this corruptible has put on incorruption, this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall the saying be fulfilled that says, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The, the sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who always gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. It is our sin and the law that could keep us confined in the valley of death. But Paul says in Romans 8, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ has set us free from the law of sin and death. Yet we'll pass through that dark valley. But because Christ went first and defeated death, defeated hell, defeated Satan, defeated anything that would hold us, as the apostle says, as we have been baptized in a death like his, we shall be risen in a resurrection like his. And death will not hold you if you are in the Lord Jesus Christ. So I would counsel you this morning to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Our Heavenly Father, I think of that old gospel song, I don't know why Jesus loved me. I don't know why he came. I don't know why he sacrificed his life. Oh, but I'm glad, so glad he did. Death has been defeated for your people, Lord. The doors of the everlasting house of the Lord have been opened for thy people. Your son has been exalted to your right hand. Because he was obedient even unto the death of the cross. And by himself once and for all made atonement for his sheep. May we rest in that, Lord. And may any skeptic that has heard these feeble words, Lord God, be touched by the spirit of truth. And this word sink down into the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joints and marrow. And may there be salvation and redemption. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.